to lift off when the clock has started. Yes, sir. Reading you loud and clear. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery, Roger Dave from Good evening and welcome to the October 16th, 2019 edition of Space News. This is Michael Abdilla and I have Tina Stagg here with me tonight and we are both from the Space Association of Australia. So let's get started with some Australian space news. Southern Launch signs a rocket launch deal with a Korean space company. Korean space company Perigee Aerospace has signed an agreement with South Australian firm Southern Launch to start launching small rockets from its proposed facility on the Air Peninsula. The first test launch of one of Perigree's appropriately named Blue Whale rockets is scheduled for next year. Perigree is Southern Launch's first commercial customer for its Whaler's Way facility at the southern tip of the Air Peninsula. The deal was signed at the International Space Conference in Adelaide recently between Southern Launch Chief Executive Lloyd Damp and Peregrine CEO Yoon Shin, who said Southern Launch offered a unique facility that was a perfect match for his company's small rocket. Southern Launch said Peregrine Aerospace was a leading orbital launch vehicle manufacturer in South Korea currently developing the small launch vehicle Blue Whale, designed to lift small satellites into low-altitude, high-inclination orbits. Perigee says these orbits are useful for weather, remote sensing and imaging satellites, and those applications are increasingly in demand for commercial, scientific and defence purposes. Blue Whale will be a small, efficient launch vehicle, designed to carry payloads of up to 50 kilograms. Perigee Aerospace already has multiple customers signed. However, in order to launch these rockets, Southern Launch needs to get its facility up and running. Its development could eventually give Australia two space launch sites. The other is the Equatorial Launch Australia facility in the Northern Territory, and maybe three if proposals for a Queensland launch facility proceed. And here's Tina with some International Space Station news. Thanks, Michael, and good evening, space fans. NASA expects to carry out 10 spacewalks at the International Space Station this northern autumn. The first set of five spacewalks being undertaken until October 25 will replace batteries on the station with the old nickel hydrogen batteries swapped with more powerful lithium iron ones. The battery spacewalks will use a rotating set of astronauts, including one by Christina Koch and Jessica Meyer, that will be NASA's first all female spacewalk. The second set of five spacewalks in November and December will attempt repairs to the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer instrument, which has failing cooling pumps. Separately, NASA recently announced a request for information seeking industry input on ways to manufacture a next-generation spacesuit called XEMU, which the agency expects to use for missions to the moon. NASA has issued a draft call for proposals to support development of commercial space stations. The draft solicitation, part of NASA's Next Step program, would fund initial studies of commercial space stations and potentially offer additional support for their development. The effort is part of NASA's broader Low Earth Orbit commercialisation strategy, which also includes adding commercial modules to the International Space Station. At a conference panel last week, former NASA Administrator Charles Bolden called on industry to step up the development and use of commercial space stations, citing the limited lifetime of the ISS. The launch of a Cygnus cargo spacecraft to the ISS has slipped by nearly two weeks. NASA said last week the Antares launch of the NG-12 Cygnus mission, previously scheduled for October 21, will now take place on November 2 from Wallops Island, Virginia. 
The agency said the forthcoming departure of the Japanese HTV-8 cargo spacecraft and other activities at the ISS, such as the ongoing series of spacewalks, caused the delay. NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk have agreed that commercial crew development is their highest priority. Bridenstein visited SpaceX's headquarters last week, nearly two weeks after criticising the company for delays in the program, as we reported on last week's Space News. The two said after the meeting that they agreed getting Crew Dragon flying as soon as possible was their top priority. A crewed test flight of the spacecraft could take place as soon as the first quarter of next year, Bridenstine said, although issues that come up in abort tests and parachute development could delay that. And in NASA planetary and space science news, a long-delayed NASA space science mission is finally in orbit. A Pegasus XL rocket placed the Ionospheric Connection Explorer, or ICON, satellite into low Earth orbit last week. The launch suffered extensive delays because of issues with the Pegasus rocket that were difficult to identify and correct on the ground. No Pegasus launches are currently on Northrop Grumman's manifest, although the company says it has two rockets available and is in discussions with potential customers. ICON will study the interaction between space weather and terrestrial weather in the ionosphere that could improve modelling of space weather activities. Turning to the US Air Force, the head of the Air Force's 45th Space Wing said last week he is working to support more commercial launch activity from Cape Canaveral. Brigadier General Douglas Scheiss said the Eastern Range may host up to 40 launches next year as it works to a goal of handling 48 launches a year. He said the range would have to update its infrastructure and change administrative processes to accommodate more launches and make operations more efficient. He said the Eastern Range could support polar launches, normally performed from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California, with SpaceX studying one such launch from the Cape. The Pentagon Space Development Agency, or SDA, has a five-year plan that includes a large satellite constellation. The plan, in a budget proposal that seeks $11 billion in the next five years, includes building a 250 satellite or larger communications network that would support a missile defence constellation and other capabilities provided by satellites in low orbits. The Pentagon requested nearly $150 million in its 2020 budget to get SDA off the ground, a figure supported by the Senate but cut by the House in their respective defence appropriations bills. The Air Force has awarded United Launch Alliance a completion contract for three Atlas V launches next year. The $98.5 million contract covers the completion and launch of three previously procured Atlas V launches of the Advanced Extremely High Frequency 6, Air Force Space Command 7 and NROL-101 missions. Those launches were purchased under the old EELV Phase 1 block buy contract that expired last month requiring the new contract to cover the cost of the launches that slipped beyond the original period of performance. A British company says it will fly a small rover, or more accurately a walker, to the moon. Spacebit said its rover, the size of a 1U CubeSat with four legs, will go to the moon on Astrobotics' Peregrine Lander mission in 2021. The rover will drop from the lander to the surface after touchdown and use its legs to move across the surface, an approach the company says could be better suited for steep, rough terrain than wheels. And back to Mike. Thank you, Tina. And let's move to some European news. A European Union official is calling on satellite operators to deorbit their satellites as soon as possible after the end of their missions. Corinne Clays, who leads the Space Task Force for the European External Action Service, 
said at a recent conference the 25-year post-mission disposal timeline in orbital debris mitigation guidelines needs to be revised so satellites are removed from orbit in a very responsible time period. Increasingly, space industry and government officials suggest those guidelines, adopted in 2002, no longer make sense in light of plans for constellations comprised of hundreds or thousands of satellites. And in Russian news, NASA astronaut Nick Haig will receive an award from Russian President Vladimir Putin. A decree signed by Putin last week awards the country's Order of Courage to Haig for courage and high professionalism during the aborted Soyuz launch to the ISS a year ago. Haig and Russian cosmonaut Alexei Ovchinin were not injured when their Soyuz spacecraft aborted its malfunctioning rocket and landed downrange of the Baikonur Cosmodrome. The two launched to the station successfully earlier this year and returned from orbit earlier this month. And moving to SpaceX. SpaceX hopes to have all the hardware in place for its commercial crew test flights by the end of the year. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk tweeted last week that he believed all the testing needed to fly the crewed Demo-2 mission should be completed by December, with the vehicles to fly the mission in Florida by then. Musk said an in-flight abort test, where a Dragon spacecraft will launch on a Falcon 9 and jettison itself from the booster, should be ready to go in late November or early December. Delays by both SpaceX and Boeing have raised concerns about NASA's access to the ISS once its existing Soyuz seats run out next northern autumn. Turning to Boeing. Boeing plans to launch an uncrewed test of its commercial crew vehicle in mid-December. A company executive said last week the orbital flight test of its CST-100 Starliner was scheduled for December 17 on an Atlas V from Cape Canaveral. The spacecraft that will fly that mission to the International Space Station is in the final stages of assembly and testing. Boeing will perform a pad abort test using another Starliner vehicle on November 4 from White Sands, New Mexico, using the spacecraft's abort motor to leap off the pad for a 90-second flight. Meanwhile, Boeing announced last week it will make a small but strategic investment in Virgin Galactic. Boeing Horizon X Ventures will invest $20 million in Virgin Galactic once its merger with special purpose acquisition company Social Capital Hedosophia closes. The companies said in a statement that they will work together to broaden commercial space access and transform global travel technologies, but offered few specifics about those plans. Both companies have expressed an interest in high-speed passenger transportation. And on to Virgin Orbit, which will launch Polish CubeSats bound for Mars. The company has partnered with a Polish small sat company, Sat Revolution, and a dozen universities in the country to launch up to three Mars missions on its Launcher 1 rocket as early as 2022. Launcher 1 is able to fly payloads weighing up to 50 kilograms on deep space trajectories. And finally tonight, the Jason 2 Earth Science Satellite has ended its mission after 11 years in orbit. NASA announced that the spacecraft ended science observations on October 1 after weeks of problems with the spacecraft's power system. Jason 2 was formally decommissioned on October 10. The mission, jointly developed by the US and France, was intended to operate for only three to five years, 
but continued working even after the launch of its replacement, Jason 3, in 2016. The spacecraft collected data on rising sea levels. Interestingly, Jason 2 may remain in orbit for as long as 1,000 years. The spacecraft's orbit, more than 1,300 kilometres high, prevents controllers from deorbiting it within the 25-year time frame established in orbital debris mitigation guidelines. The spacecraft will instead remain in orbit for 500 to 1,000 years, its orbit decaying at an initial rate of just 40 metres per year. Well, that's all we have time for in Space News tonight. Thank you, Tina, and we'll speak to you again next week. Good night.